Okay, if we could get everybody back to their seats. We're gonna get going. <laughs> okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody to the last day of Canola Week, the Canola Innovation Day. Um, for those of you I don't know, my name is Sally Vale. I'm a research scientist at Ag Canada, and I also have the pleasure of co-chairing Canola Week with Clint Yerke and our wonderful committee. Um, so, welcome to Calgary for those of us who are with us um, here in person, and also welcome to our online, um, our online audience. Um, so just a quick note for those that are in the room, um, if you need a complimentary parking pass, um, that's available to you. Um, so go and see um, the front desk, go see Erin at the front desk just outside the room here and she can make sure that you don't have to pay for parking. Um, so before we begin, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta and also the City of Calgary is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Districts 5 and 6. I'd also like to thank our sponsors this year. So our top sponsors are BSF and Bayer. And also um, big thanks to Proven Seed who have sponsored um, several of the students that are here with us in, in the audience today. Um, would also like to acknowledge the Alberta, Alber Alberta Canola Corteva High Tech Productions Limited, Manitoba Canola Growers, and also SAS Canola. Um, and we also couldn't run this event without support from the Canadian Canola Growers Association, New Seed, Brett Young Seeds, DL Seeds, Syngenta, Western Grains Research Foundation, and Winfield United. So thanks so much to our sponsors. Can we give a round of applause for our So also a special welcome to anyone from the media that happens to be in our audience. Um, so today is Canola Innovation Day, and this is the portion of the meeting which is all about exploring emerging ideas and opportunities um, to innovate and drive future advances in the canola industry. Um, so I have one note about the program. Um, we have a, a bit of a change in the afternoon in that we are going to start the gene editing session about 1.40. So we're going to have two talks. Um, after lunch and then we'll move right into the gene editing session. So that will be a little bit more extended than what um, you see in your programs. Um, so we, we value your interaction today. Um, remember for uh, the audience in the crowd, remember if you have a question, make sure you're talking into the mic because our online audience can't hear what you're saying unless there's a mic, even if your vo voice is really loud. Um, please make sure you have a microphone. Um, and then for those of us who are joining virtually, um, we encourage you to contribute using the Q&A function um, in Zoom. And if you're, um, if you're not full of questions, you can use the thumbs up option on the Q&A and these will upvote the questions so our moderators can make sure that um, we're relaying the most popular questions. Um, so if you need Wi-Fi access if you're in the room, um, the network is CCOC, and the network pass password is KLR6V. Um, and if um, you didn't catch that, I'm sure you can talk to our IT people or Aaron outside. Um, and we'd also encourage you to tweet along with us during the conference. The hashtag is CanolaWeek2023. And for those of you who are collecting CCA credits, um, we're going to show the QR codes on the screen at the end of the day. And the in-person attendees can sign the registration desk um, just outside the room. And so once again, in lieu of speaker gifts, um, we are going to be making a donation to the Keith Downey Undergraduate Scholarship at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, we've done this the past couple of years, and we feel it's a good, good way to acknowledge our speakers and also um, our students in agriculture and also one of the meeting founders. Um, so with that, we can um, get going on the agenda. Our first chair is Curtis Rempel, so I'd like to welcome him to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Sally. As Sally said, my name is Curtis Rempel. I'm the Vice President for Crop Production Innovation with the Canola Council of Canada. I'm going to be chairing the session today on uh, canola meal or canola protein valorization. 
something that's always, uh, that I'm always quite passionate about as well. Uh, just uh, uh, Dr. Sam Cook had a great um, thing going yesterday with the use of the uh, TARDIS taking you back in time. And uh, just to follow that, if you take the TARDIS back in time on canola meal valorization, it started off with uh, um, uh, utilization in, poultry, in monogastric rations and showing all of the value um, that, that could be had in monogastric rations. Um, and also thinking about uh, what to do with the fiber uh, in, uh, uh, that could be occluded or, or uh, that is bound up and that we, that we maybe need to deal with in terms of making things more appropriate for monogastric rations. Then we moved into dairy, uh, ruminant nutrition, and that's where canola meal has sort of really found its niche. Uh, the research shows unequivocally that uh, feeding canola meal in the ration is one more liter of milk per cow per day. And along with that comes a significant reduction in methane emissions along with that liter per cow per day. And so that's been the calling card and uh, a, a large focus of our research and our current cluster research. And we're also moving into aquaculture, which is another big emerging space. But today we're going to get some more ideas on what we can also do with meal valorization because as we've talked about in the last couple of days, we're going to be crushing a lot more canola in Canada and adding value to the meal is really, really significant. We also have some really, uh, some key private investment in the space too. For those of you who've been following the space, Corteva Life Sciences ha has been involved in, in, um, in some significant breeding and innovation efforts around, around fiber in, in meal and the utilization of fiber. So we also have a lot of private, and, and there's other companies as well, that, so there's a lot of private investment in this space as well as public research. So it makes for a great, uh, space for innovation, and with that, I'm going to get going. So we have three speakers today. Two are two of them are uh, online, and one is here in person. I'm going to introduce the speakers right now, and not take time in between. Uh, but in in between the uh, the the, se uh, the speakers themselves. Our first speaker is Dr. Janitha Wenosandera. Janitha is a research scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada uh, at the Saskatoon Centre. She holds a doctorate in food science and has contributed over 200 peer-reviewed publications, book chapters, and presentations in the area of food protein chemistry and technology. Brassica oilseed meal valorization through understanding their protein components is one of the key objectives of her research program. She's a certified food scientist and a fellow of the Oil Chemist Society, uh, uh, American Oil Chemist Society. Our second recorded presentation is by Dr. Nandika Bandera, Nandika is an assistant professor in Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Food and Bioproducts, Department of Human and Food Nutrition Sciences at the University of Manitoba. And he's going to, Nandika will be presenting on downstream processing use, uh, re related to biopolymer applications as well. And, uh, and then last but not least, we have a presentation in person. Our, our in-person presenter is Dr. Anna Rogowicz from the University of Manitoba. Anna is Assistant Professor of Nutritional Biochemistry in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada. Her research is focused on the evaluation of the chemical and nutritional characteristics of various feed ingredients, the exploration of exogenous enzyme supplementation effects, poultry nu nutrition, and uh, examination of the gut microflora and the gut microbiome and its impact on, on health and protection of monogastrics. She's made substantial contributions in the research on evaluation of nutritional va uh, value of uh, conventional yellow-seeded napus and canola quality juncea. With that, our first presentation, uh, that would be Dr. Winnie Sandera, I think, coming on screen. I thank the organizing committee for having me in this session, and I'm happy to share a few highlights of the work conducted at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada on canola meal valorization. In my presentation, I'll briefly discuss the nature of canola meal and then composition-based approaches for valorization by modifying fiber or protein, and also by fractionating fiber and protein of the meal. Canola seed provides oil, which is the primary product. The oil removed residue of seed or meal is the byproduct of oil extraction process. As summarized in this schematic at the industrial level, uh, canola oil can be obtained in three ways. At the top is the most widely used process, 
uh, at the industrial level, prepress solvent extraction, which produces oil for vegetable oil market, and the byproduct, the diesel anti-toasted meal or DT meal, that is for feed market. In this process, pressing together with solvent extraction uh, recovers more oil to more seed oil and then the hexane wet meal is heated to recover more solvent and produce a dry meal. Secondly, canola oil can be produced by pressing only and it could be done by double pressing to recover more oil. By doing so, the meal is meal get heated and uh, more oil can be removed and uh, it is used by mostly uh, suitable for biofuel industry to avoid cost of oil solvent extraction but uh, recover uh, more oil from the seed. Cold pressing is also a form of pressing to obtain oil for organic uh, virgin canola oil market and ensures that meal is not heated above 60 degrees C but it is only a partial removal of oil under cold pressing. This pie chart shows comparison of uh, components of canola seed cake and DT meal based on weight of one kilogram of each. So the numbers here are four grams of each component. The difference between the press cake and meal is in oil and protein content. The cake of cold pressing contains 13 to 16% oil. As I said, it's only partial removal of oil. Fiber content of both materials are fairly close. Proteins of oil seeds have a significant market value because of the availability um, as a co-product of another process and also the properties of proteins that are naturally present in oil seeds. Canola is the main oil seed crop in Canada. The cake and meal of oil extraction is a rich source of protein from which plant proteins can be derived. Canola protein can be part of the plant protein transition we are witnessing at present. Usually wet extraction processes are employed to recover proteins of oil seed meals. A good example is soy protein concentrate and isolate production from soy bean meal. Wet extraction processes require the meal protein to be sufficiently soluble to recover them from the meal. This graph shows how solubility of canola seed protein changes as seed seeds are processed for oil. Seed meal samples withdrawn at uh, each processing step where heat is involved uh, from a large scale processing facility, canola processing facility, and was tested for solubility of protein at acidic, neutral, and basic pHs. It is clear that regardless of extracting a pH, the solubility property of protein changed and decreased as the oil extraction process progressed. The largest solubility drop occurred after desolentized toasting. Most of the time, hot solvent, uh, hot hexane extraction is assumed causing the solubility drop, but it is the heat of the desolentized toasting step from the live steam and toasting at temperatures above 100 degrees uh, causes the changes in protein properties. The blue color bars here in this uh, uh, graph indicates the uh, protein dispersibility index or PDI values at neutral pH, um, which the protein ingredient index industry use as a quality measure. PDI also decreased drastically uh, after desolentized toast step. It indirectly shows aggregation of protein, making them not available to disperse. This bar chart provides a comparison between cold pressed, double pressed, and uh, solid extracted, uh, desolentized, toasted uh, rapeseed meal uh, for protein recovery values. This work was conducted by a group of uh, researchers in Sweden using rapeseed meal processed in commercial facilities, and they used this fairly close uh, pH value, alkali pH, uh, as our study uh, to solubilize protein. The data further, this data further confirms DT meal protein is difficult to recover compared to cold press or double press meal. And the lower the impact of heat on meal, better protein recovery from meal. 
The hypothesis is that heating at temperatures above 80 degrees centigrade causes strong interaction between reactive entities of protein and seed fiber, making them less soluble. Most likely the charge, charge entities or residues of proteins become unavailable to get ionized and uh, move into solution. Therefore, one of the approaches we tested was modification of meal fiber by a bioconversion process. The schematic here shows the complex nature of cartilage and cell wall, which makes up most of the inner fiber besides the seed coat fiber of canola meal. It can be expected that enzymes produced by microorganisms such as fungi release a variety of carbohydrates, phytases, and also proteolytic enzymes when they grow on canola meal. Due to the activity of these enzymes on fiber fraction, it is expected that protein fiber interactions get interrupted and proteins will become more soluble. In this study, both the cold pressed canola cake and desolvent toasted meal, a canola meal were in investigated under solid state fermentation for using two aspergillus species with the strains that, that are having grass status. This picture shows uh, growth progression of uh, progression of growth of uh, two fungi strains up to 72 hours on 50% moisture containing meal and cake. Uh, the clear white mycelial growth becomes visible at 48 hours, except in the case of Aspergillus oryzae on DT meal. Uh, although an increase in soluble protein level was expected uh, after this uh, bioconversion, but no significant effect was found due to uh, due to this bio transformation. Both fungi species used uh, oil in the press cake, and it reduced the oil content and it reduced phytates and total phenolics of both canola meals. There is evidence of fiber modification, bleaching of meal, and changes in texture of the meal. But this approach was suitable only for modifying fiber, not for solubility improvement, uh, to bring sufficient uh, changes to obtain protein by wet extraction of these meals. In the protein modification uh, approach, um, uh, we utilized amino acids that can, that make up the proteins in the meal. It was expected that chemical hydrolysis uh, may be suitable to break meal protein down to amino acids, and released amino acids can be converted to compounds that can deliver useful functions. Here we compared cold press uh, seed cake with a DT meal for amino acid production via acid hydrolysis. Hydrochloric acid is the a standard acid used for hydrolyzing proteins in amino acid analysis, and we used uh, sulfuric acid as an alternative. In each of the box here indicates the amount of protein in kilogram of uh, cold press cake and uh, DT meal, and the protein that can be extracted from uh, those uh, material, and the amino acids that can be released from acid hydrolysis. What was observed here under a chemical hydrolysis DT meal released lesser amount of amino acid compared to cold press meal. The effect of DT process um, is uh, extensive than we thought. It is not only causing a strong protein fiber interaction, it actually affects the protein structure, making peptide bonds less prone to chemical hydrolysis. The bar chart here shows the levels of amino acid that can be recovered from canola meals and the protein extracted from them. Glutamic acid is the most abundant amino acid in uh, seed protein, and so as the amino acids that can be recovered from the meal, followed by other charged uh, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, and uh, uh, hydrophilic, hydrophobic, and charged amino acids. The level of glutamic acid varied uh, depending on whether it is meal or protein that was subjected to acid hydrolysis. Interesting to note that DT meal protein gave higher amount of glutamic acid than all others. Even the lesser amount of protein is recovered. Maybe that protein contains more glutamic acid-containing proteins. The market value for free amino acids 
uh, is in the animal feed, food additive, nutritional supplements, pharmaceutical, and also in the uh, personal care industry, particularly for green biodegradable surfactant production. They continued this study to test potential application for amino acid mixtures derived from canola meal through a chemical conversion process. Uh, fatty acid can be attached to uh, amino acids, particularly uh, through the nitrogen end, uh, using short and bond one reaction. The fatty acid of interest here is lauric acid, which is uh, quite a common fatty acid in the personal care products. Reason to se uh, select N acylation is um, that the N acyl amino acids have a milder effect on skin as a surfactant besides their biodegradability. These compounds generated can canola meal acid, uh, amino acid mixtures um, showed very good surfactant properties requiring lesser amount to reduce surface tension of water than sodium lauryl sulfate and also made a stable form that can be washed off. The other advantage of these surfactant compounds that uh, generated from uh, canola meal amino acids is their antimicrobial activity when they tested against uh, selected uh, food pathogens, particularly Listeria monocytogenes and Salmonella enteritis, at much lower concentration than uh, sodium lauryl sulfate. Sodium lauryl sulfate is an anionic, anionic surfactant found in many personal care products. The third approach we tested was fractionating um, fiber and protein uh, to obtain fractions that contain rich in fiber and rich in protein from of canola. Anyone can argue that it is simple to separate canola meal protein from fiber by just extracting protein at alkali pH to take protein out, and the fiber is the protein depleted residue. However, this way, way of making canola protein for bulk protein market has been tested many, many times in the past and showed no success. One reason to keep in mind is not like legumes such as soya pulses, the proteins in canola seed are quite different in their properties. Two types of proteins are found in canola and mustard seeds. Um, the small uh, protein, 2-S-napin, is different in amino acid composition, um, soluble in a wider pH range, and also withstand a wide range of temperatures without coagulation compared to 11 s protein the cruciferin protein found in the same seed. The process we developed and tested separates two, separates two S proteins from um, the 12 S proteins uh, and also soluble fiber from seed coat fiber. Product one and four can, are protein rich products, but two different protein types. Product three and four are the fiber fractions of seed meal, um, which are different in composition and product two contains soluble fiber and some protein. The bar graph here shows when cold pressed canola meal is fractionated using the process described in the previous slide. A cold pressed canola cake without removing oil as well as where removing oil either using hexanoethanol uh, in, at a temperature below 40 degrees C uh, was fractionated and compared here. The red dotted triangle, uh, rectangles enclose protein-rich fractions, and the black ones enclose uh, fiber-rich fractions of, the, uh, of this process. Nafin fraction is lesser in amount than uh, cruciferin, uh, which is it's, uh, pr proportionate to the abundance in the seed. The other two protein-rich fractions, uh, these two protein-rich fractions captured 60-65% of male protein. Interesting to note that here is about this 2S protein fraction, the protein purity. It was recovered in very high purity, almost at 98% uh, on dry weight basis, even when oil containing press cake was used. This means for obtaining 2S napin protein of canola press cake, an additional deoiling step is not needed. Uh, however, residual oil uh, Content affected purity of 12 S protein fraction. Uh, that is the reason for low protein content in this fraction from the non deoiled press cake. 
The soluble fraction on product tree contains sugars that constitute inner cell wall fiber. Aldopensos is like uh, arabinos and silos and also glucose and galactose. Maybe some oligosaccharides are there too uh, in this fraction. And this fraction is uh, because of their composition is a suitable substrate for fermentation. Clean seed coat fiber is another fiber, pro fiber product of this process. This map shows where oil seed uh, uh, processing plants uh, are located in Canada. Currently, there are 14 uh, in operation and five more to come. Um, mostly uh, the ones in, pro in the Prairie Provinces crush canola seeds. The number of uh, numbers in the table shows the increase in trend of domestic canola oil processing as reported by Canadian Oil Seed Processors Association or COPA. Almost all of these operations except the one the facility that use double pressing produces DT meal that is destined for feed market. It has to accept that the, um, a large portion of economic value for canola is in the oil market and the oil extraction process is, is optimized to recover most of the seed oil. But DT meal that is largely produced is not the most suitable starting material for maximizing value of meal in the direction of plant protein market which is beyond the animal feed use. This depiction is for the protein transition that shows a first generation plant protein value proposition. Um, that is where canola meal has been in throughout past 50 years, converting plant proteins uh, to animal proteins, meat, milk, and eggs. The efficiency of this protein conversion heavily depends on the animal species and the final product. The protein transition is global and happening for sustainability reasons, considering Earth resources, the environment we are in, and the consequences that future generations have to cope with, and also for securing sustainability of food production systems. Therefore, the second generation uh, protein products with more greening um, of uh, protein-rich products is happening. Uh, the third generation uh, uh, products, uh, it is expected that sustainable production systems of animal protein will be incorporated. As the industry stands today, DT meal is most suitable for first generation applications to convert into animal proteins. For economic sustainability of canola protein production, integration of oil extraction is logical and it lowers initial capital investment and can operate as another product line, so along with oil processing facilities. Not all canola meal has to, uh, that is domestically produced, how to move for generating proteins. Similar to soy protein industry, only a portion is needed to be processed under suitable oil extraction conditions to save proteins for further use. A question to ask from those who are in this business of science and production is whether the canola meal available from current to practiced oil extraction process is expected to align with protein transition or any other value addition directions involving proteins. Because to progress canola in value added juices based on proteins, current meal processing practices need to be re-evaluated to produce a suitable canola meal starting material. I thank the funding support provided by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, Agriculture Development Fund of uh, Saskatchewan Minister of Agriculture and Saskanola for the research projects carried out on canola meal future developments for the growing bioeconomy. Also, I wish to thank collaborating scientists from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, the technical staff and students who worked on these research projects. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tandika Bandara. I'm an assistant professor and a Canada research chair in food protein and bioproducts at University of Manitoba. 
In my research group, I primarily focus on value-added application of protein, as well as value-added application for the agricultural byproducts in food and non-food applications, especially in bioproduct applications. With this one, we do work on research related to the circular bioeconomy. What is circular bioeconomy? That's basically trying to integrate every aspect of the agriculture or any industry value chain into value-added application rather than focusing on one item or one commodity as the main income source. For example, if we think about the canola, oil is a primary source, but at the same time, canola protein, the lignin, cellulose, and everything else do have applications in different industries. So trying to integrate or create value for these other commodities is one of the pillars in the circular bioeconomy concept. With this in mind, we do see great opportunities for canola industry in circular bioeconomy concepts, especially in using canola protein and other materials as biopolymers to develop food and non-food applications for different industries. One of, the, one of those industries are primarily about the packaging industry. So traditionally, packaging industry is dominated by the synthetic plastic material, but at the same time, we can use biopolymer-based packaging material to replace those synthetic plastic-based materials. However, unlike the synthetic material, uh, biopolymer-based materials have a limited or like limitations in terms of their mechanical strength and their barrier properties. So in our group, we do research or we conduct research on how to improve those material properties and how to improve those barrier properties in order to use canola meal as a biopolymer source for biomaterial or bioproduct applications in different industries. So are we just focusing on the canola protein? The answer is no. We do focus on the canola protein. We started our research focusing on canola protein and how we can create a value chain or create value-added products to the canola protein. But at the same time, right now we are focusing on how we can use the entire canola meal, not just focusing on the canola protein alone. So we are trying to valorize the entire canola meal into cellulose, lignin, protein, and hemicellulose, and trying to use this to develop value-added applications. For example, cellulose can be break down into nanocrystalline cellulose, which is an additive used in multiple different industries. Lignin, that can be separated from the canola meal can be broken down into small phenolic groups or phenolic compounds, which can be used as platform chemical in other industries. Protein obviously can be used in either food or feed formulation at the same time can be used in industrial applications such as adhesives or bio-based plastics. So with this, right now our approach in our research group is trying to valorize this canola meal and other agricultural byproducts for that matter, into cellulose, hemicellulose, and other protein, and at the same time, uh, trying to create platform chemicals and value-added products using these materials. Why are we focusing on the plastic industry or the packaging industry? When we look at the plastic production in the world, this is one of the biggest environmental concern in the world. Food packaging industry alone is producing around 78 million metric tons of plastic every year. Unfortunately, only 14% of that plastic is recycled, with others usually ended up in landfills or other water resources. So with that in mind, we need to find some alternative solutions for this plastic industry. At the same time, we do get the governmental law like lobbying group pressure to the plastic industry or the food packaging industry for example, Canada already banned the single-use plastic. UK also banned the single-use plastic. So these are some of the examples where countries come together and trying to improve the sustainability in the food packaging industry. So with that, we have to find those alternatives such as biopolymers. But unfortunately, even though we have a large number of biopolymers such as protein, fatty acid, polysaccharide, starch, and even cellulose, that can be used as a biopolymer resources for food packaging application, there are bigger challenges when it comes to the packaging industry. What you see in this screen is a picture of this styrene monomer unit and how we can create uh, polystyrene when we use the same monomer unit 
to make the polystyrene, which is one of the biggest or like mostly used plastic material in food packaging industry. How many of you played this game that you see on the end of that slide, uh, which is basically you get different shapes of blocks and size of blocks where you have to fit together with the same color where you get this goal. So think about this assembly of monomers in the same way like that game. So if you find the perfectly fitting uh, units, then you can create a very nice polymer. But what happens is when you try to create a polymer with styrene monomer, because they are identical to each other, you can create very nice and unique polymer with a strong material properties. Let's come back to protein, which is one of our targets. So protein is made out of 20 different amino acid, which is not the same as that styrene unit with identical monomer unit. 24 amino acids are different in their structure, their size, and their chemical properties. So when we try to make a polymer out of those 20 different amino acids, which present in canola protein, now we cannot make the same unique crystalline polymer with good material properties. So that's where we are trying to use different approaches to improve these material properties in protein-based addresses. So this research was basically done by a couple of students in my research group, mainly Tirin Saraika and Christina Shoraev, Christina Shaiwes, uh, both PhD student and Tirin was a master's student at the time. So we explore how we can use different nanomaterials like nanocrystalline cellulose, which can be derived from the canola meal itself, and graphite oxide, and how we can use those materials to develop packaging materials in a sustainable way with a better material properties. So in the first study, what we did was we basically use a chemical oxidation method to improve the nanomaterial properties itself. Because when we think about nanocrystalline cellulose, which is a renewable nano, nanomaterial coming from cellulose, they have amazing properties when it comes to their material properties. But unfortunately, when we think about their mixability or the dispersion capacity of the nanocellulose in a plant protein-based matrix like canola protein, they're not really good because when you add a nanomaterial into a polymer, if it ex exfoliated in the polymer matrix, or we call it exfoliation when the nanomaterial disperse really well, then you will get a really good material properties in the plastic material. But if the nanomaterials tend to aggregate, then instead of giving a better results, now that aggregated nanomaterial or the location of that aggregate nanomaterial aggregate becomes a weak point in the packaging material, which is not ideal. So what we did in this particular research is trying to modify the nanocellulose by oxidation using tempo-mediated oxidation, tetramethyl piperidine oxyl compound, and create more carboxylic group in the nanocellulose. So what this one do, is it will convert the hydroxyl group on the cellulose surface, nanocellulose surface, into carboxylic group with a higher surface charge. So this modified nanocellulose will now repel from each other because they increased negative charge. Then we use the uh, solvent casting method to create the films and then take a look at the different parameters when it comes to the packaging materials. The first thing we wanted to measure is how our oxidation method is appropriate for this particular research. So when we did the conductometric titration, we found out that we successfully managed to convert almost closer to 20% of the hydroxyl group present in the nanocellulose into carboxylic group, which is a pretty good degree of conversion when we think about the properties that it will change. And then we use the FTIR to confirm this particular tempo-mediated oxidation as well. When we look at the mechanical properties, one thing that you would observe is if you look at the canola protein alone, which is which you can see in here, the tensile strength of the canola protein-based films is around 3 megapascal. But when we add the nanocellulose without any modification, we can actually increase it up to almost 7 megapascal which is more than doubling the strength of the material by adding 5% nanocellulose on protein weight into the material. So this is a small amount of nanocellulose we're adding, but the material strength increase more than double. When we do the tempo-mediate oxidation, as you can see in here, at the same addition level, 
now you can get over 9 megapascal strength, which is three times more than the initial strength that you get, but yet in the same tens of uh, tempo, like tempo oxidized nanocellulose. Same thing we observe in the tensile modulus or the flexibility of the film when we add higher amount of, let's say, uh, tempo mediated oxidized like nanocellulose, we see the increase in the flexibility of the material. Elongation at breaks shows how stretchable the material is. Usually when we increase the strength of the material, the stretchability of the material will reduce. So which is why you would see with the increased tensile strength that there is a reduction in the stretchability of the material. But still with the nanocellulose, the elongation at break or the stretchability of the material is still better than the control films. Then the other thing we wanted to look at is the looking at the water vapor permeability. So tempo mediated oxidation did not do a significant change in the water vapor permeability. There was a little bit of reduction, but at the same time, it's not as we expected or as we wanted. The reason is even the tempo mediated oxidation is still a hydrophilic reaction. We are replacing hydroxyl group of the nanocellulose into carboxylic groups. So that's the reason why we did not see a huge improvement in the water vapor permeability. We did look at the contact angle or the wettability of the films. For example, if we can create a surface that water will just run off without adhering into the surface, that material will have a really good water resistant properties as well as the strength in like when it comes contact with the water. So when you add a drop of water using the uh, nano indenter into the material, if it's spread on the surface, that means the contact angle is low. If it stays as a water bubble or higher contact angle, that means the surface hydrophobicity of that film is higher. So when we add the nanocrystalline cellulose, as you can see in this chart, especially at 3% and 5% uh, nanomaterial addition levels of oxidized nanomaterial, you can see there is a significant improvement in the surface hydrophobicity of the films that we prepare. So this is one of the good or like a better advantage when it comes to uh, plastic, like biopolymer based plastic materials. We did take a look at the thermal stability of the material as well. So with the addition of the nanomaterial, we identify the materials more thermally stable in the thermogravimetric analysis using thermogravimetric analysis. So in the first study, what we focus is on trying to improve the dispersion of the nanomaterial. We did see a big improvement in the material properties, but at the same time, some of the properties we wanted did not improve in the same way. So in the second, second study, we look at how can we improve the canola protein-based nanocomposite films by using a hydrophobic modification. For example, how can we graft a oleic acid, which is a main fatty acid present in canola meal, into the nanocrystalline cellulose, make it more hydrophobic material, and how can we use that one to develop new packaging materials? So basically what we did was we graphed the oleic acid compounds into nanocrystalline cellulose using hydrogen bonds and other covalent interactions. And then this is a process that we use. I'm not gonna go in detail about the process that we do the grafting, but just like in the other, uh, like previous research, we did look at how much oleic acid we grafted onto the nanocellulose surface. So when we look at based on the weight gain, we actually graft around 8% of the oleic acid into nanocellulose. So if you take like 100 gram of oleic, uh, nanocellulose, modified nanocellulose, now you have around like 8% oleic acid in that one, grafted onto the nanocellulose surface. And we did confirm this oleic acid grafting into nanocellulose using the FKR as well, just to make sure they actually graft onto the nanocellulose surface. And then we use the same method in order to prepare the films. And with the film preparation, we observe some unique results. So tensile strength will increase with the addition of the uh, oleic acid grafted nanomaterials compared to the control, which is a good thing. But at the same time, the elastic modulus, so the elongation at break is not reducing in the same way compared to the previous study. So in fact, when we increase the tensile strength, the elongation, uh, the elastic modulus is actually keeping almost similar without much of change, much better than the control sample. But at the same time, the elastic modulus is not reducing. So the material is still flexible. 
or stretchable. When we look at the elongation at break, or how much we can elongate it compared to the control, now we can see this hydrophobically modified or oleic acid grafted nanocellulose is increasing the elongation of the material significantly compared to the control samples. So this is a unique advantage when it comes to improving the uh, material properties of the packaging film. Water vapor permeability is another thing that we look at in this one. But unlike in the previous study, we did see a unique reduction in the water vapor permeability of the oleic acid grafted nanocellulose reinforced packaging materials, which is ideal. Then we did look at the wettability. Theoretically, we should have seen a better contact angle compared to the previous study, but we did not. So then we did some research to find out why we are not seeing improved surface hydrophobicity, which it should generate with the hydrophobic groups we're adding into the packaging film, but why we are not seeing the same result. So what we realize is when we add the hydrophobically modified nanocellulose into this packaging material, the glycerol we add to prepare the packaging film, which is a plasticizer we used in both studies, now the migration of glycerol from the packaging film over the time into the surface of the packaging film is much higher compared to the previous modification, which in fact, because glycerol is hydrophilic as well, which allows to reduce contact angle, which is not something that we expected. But right now we are doing research on how to mitigate this issue and improve the surface hydrophobicity using the same uh, modification for nanocellulose, but trying to reduce the glycerol migration. One other thing that I really want to highlight is one of the most recent things that we did with the graphite oxide nanoparticles. Graphite oxide is another renewable nanoparticle generates from graphite, which we see in everywhere. So if you take a pencil, that lead is made out of graphite. But those are layered graphite, but we can break those layers into really tiny particles and basically come to a single layer graphite like sheet. If we make it into a single layer, we usually call it graphene. And graphene is one of the high value ingredient used in the electronic industry. If we add graphene, yes, it will improve the properties in the same way like in the graphite oxide. But in our case, we don't need the single layer graphene. So we did the oxidation for graphite and convert the graphite into graphite oxide. Basically, the meaning of graphite oxide is we have multi-layer graphene. So instead of one layer, now we have four, five, six layers together, but still much like significantly lower layer, like density than the original graphite. So the basic idea of this research is to use graphite oxide change the oxygen functional groups in the graphite by adding oxygen functional groups by oxidation, and then use those different carbon to oxygen ratio, different oxidation, like differently uh, prepared graphite oxide with different oxygen functional groups into the canola protein based films, and then looking at the mechanical strength and the barrier properties. So as you can see here, when we change the modification of the graphite oxide, we increase the carbon to oxygen ratio, or we decrease the carbon to oxygen ratio, which means we introduce more oxygen functional groups compared to the graphite. And we confirm this different oxygen functional groups with X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. And we recognize there are more hydroxyl groups, carboxyl groups, and covalently bind carbon in the oxidized graphite oxide. One of the things, like I'm not going to go through all the results, but one of the things that we observe with the graphite oxide reinforced packaging films is an excellent improvement of the oxygen barrier properties, which is one of the key challenge that we have with most biopolymer-based packaging materials. So as you can see in here, the, um, like the, let's say the rate of reduction of oxygen permeability of controlled canola film into the graphite oxide added films is over 600% reduction, or six times reduction in the uh, oxygen permeability, which is an outstanding result when it comes to the oxygen permeability values. So right now we are looking at this one in improving the material properties using combination of nanocellulose and graphite oxide in the same material. So we can improve the material strength at the same time improving the uh, oxygen barrier properties as well, not just the water vapor permeability. 
So with that, we realize by using nanomaterials and chemically modifying them into different ways, we can actually improve the biopolymer-based materials into value-added applications. So we can simply downstream process the canola meal, take the protein out, use it in the plastic industry, and then use it in the adhesive industry while developing other platform chemicals from compounds like cellulose and lignin. So this is something that we are trying to work on it right now. And at the same time, we are trying to use extrusion molding to translate the results we got with this particular research and then use it in the pilot scale studies. With that, I want to acknowledge my research team who basically conducted this research. So you can see some of the students, uh, Christina and uh, Thilini, who did this research, uh, basically. Right now, I have another student who engaged in the research uh, who's not in this picture. And oh, she's actually right here. So she's another student who works in this particular research, Aunt Ida. And we, this is a group who basically enabled the research that I conduct in my research group. And as I mentioned, apart from the biopolymer-based like uh, value-added applications, I do work on protein ingredient processing, especially using uh, byproducts such as canola as well. At the end, I want to acknowledge my funding agencies, my university, and the Richardson Center for Food Technology and Research, especially the funding agencies such as NSERC, Sustainable Cap, uh, New Frontiers in Research, Research Manitoba, and all the other funding agencies, including NSERC and CFIA, CFI, for enabling me to conduct this research, and especially Manitoba Canola Growers, who recently funded this canola protein-based packaging film research which is not like uh, officially signed yet, but still uh, one of my main funding partner when it comes to canola protein-based packaging materials. So I want to acknowledge all of them uh, for their funding support and continuous financial support to continue this research. With that, I'm very happy to answer to any questions uh, through an email. So please send me an email if you have any question and I would be happy to answer. And thank you very much. morning if I'm not going to compete with the excitement that Dr. Bandera <laughs> expressed so <laughs> nice as you as you see the the research is always the trial and error and moving forward um, thank you so much for invitation I'm so glad to be here and uh, my name is Anna Rogivich came from University of Manitoba and uh, where is my presentation okay here I am so, um, so I will. I, I listened to uh, carefully the, my, my um, <coughs> uh, co-presenters. I will um, present something similar, and certain things will overlap with what Dr. Janita was presenting as uh, the, the first one. But I will I will get give the a little bit uh, different, more practical pers perspective. I'm the I'm the animal nutritionist, um, so I will focus on the on the um, getting extra value of canola meal for the uh, for animals. Um, <coughs> I will acknowledge the the um, co-authors and the co-scientists I was working with, Dr. Slominski was uh, leading the, the research, um, and the young senior Stella is our PhD um, graduate already. She was instrumental in this, in this research. I, two objectives of my presentation will be to, to, to show how canola meal fiber can be um, upcycled into um, bioactive components um, uh, that could be use, useful and beneficial for, for um, um, monogastric animals. And, uh, and I will show you how we uh, try to, to apply the enzyme technology to release those bioactive components and um, th that, that could derive from the fiber, fiber fraction of canola and will be useful for, for um, um, monogastric animals. But first of all, I, wanted, I will just toss all the information. I wanted to acknowledge the, the great research which has been done for years particularly with the, with the support and involvement of Canola Council of Canada 
and other bodies. For years, Dr. Slominski was leading the, the research on promoting canola meal. As you know, it's a technically waste of the, of the industry which is designed for producing oil. However, this waste has a great, great resources. Animal, um, animals can recycle it from the, the particular protein, which is not, not useful for human consumption, but they may convert them to the protein source for our consumption. Um, that is the great advantage. We've always been promoting canola meal as a great source of protein. And then uh, we also, also did the lots of studies provide the scientific evidence that that even high inclusion of canola meal is not a concern for the um, monogastric animal nutrition. Um, a plethora of the studies was done with the multiple species swine poultry um, that, that we concluded that 50, 20 percent could be, could be easily used without providing an adverse effect as the feed industry and animal nutritionists usually would, traditionally has been reluctant on. Um, uh, the, of course, the glucosinolate content is not an issue anymore because the, the, due to the excellent plant breeding, the glucosinolate content is um, it's, it's low. So um, we also kind of um, um, got the evidence that the glucosinolates are not causing the adverse effect. Um, our research also kind of show that canola can be used by but, but we, we, we established the, the strategy how to use canola to overcome those issues. So when diets are formulated based on digestible amino acid level and the based on the, on the available energy, the metabolizable energy, there should not be issue. That's definitely, it's go all on the hands of the, whoever is formulating diets to properly apply this data into, into formulation. Therefore, animals will, will get um, um, the nutrients and then and their requirements will be met. We also um, done the survey on the canola meal from the different producers and uh, we realized how important processing conditions are on the, on the canola meal quality. And this is also well documented. It's, um, I'm talking definitely about the, the, the heat and moisture treatment. So because the heat, heat may, um, uh, may contribute or overheating may contribute to the decreasing of the protein quality. Therefore, it has been addressed and our processors are very smart and they're doing a really good job now to, to kind of preserving the quality. And then, and then, of course, as we know, the canola meal is rich in, fi in dietary fiber. And therefore, um, we tried to, to think about this, because in animal nutrition, when something goes wrong, the people kind of blame the, ah, that's because of fiber. That's not true. Um, fiber is a, it's a, such a huge term, and, uh, and it's so, such a complex um, um, creature. So we definitely have to really, really understand the fiber. Each feed ingredients will have a different, not only fiber comp content, but, but fiber structure, fiber properties. So, uh, so overall, over the several years of research and using and promoting canola meal, we always say like we facilitate the fiber friendly diet formulation. Um, for years, it was, a, it was sort of like a contradiction for the human nutrition. We're all talking, oh, fiber is a good thing. If it comes to animal nutrition, it was like, eh, yeah, bad fiber. No, um, uh, we have to really consider that the diet should be wholesome and contains all the, not only nutrients, but the physical parts of the, of the diet that, that, that affect the health and the, and the productivity of animals. So understanding the fiber is the key of the success. As I mentioned earlier, each feed ingredients will have a different volume of fiber, fiber and then different structure. So, so we focus on the, on the canola fiber and we, we realize that, that there is a huge opportunity of using it. And then because, because fiber has a prebiotic potential, and I wanted to, I will emphasize later as my presentation progress what, what we've done with this. As Dr. Sominski always says that the canola fiber is, um, it, it's composed of the 
good, uh, good, bad, and ugly uh, things. So non-starch polysaccharides being the good one. They're predominant in the fiber structure in canola meal, so we definitely wanted to take advantage of it. Lignin polyphenols, basically more present in the, in the canola hull. Um, those are the, the bad guys, kind of like a rather the filler and not really contributing anything to, um, to the um, um, animals. However, importance in the, in the gut physiology it's also a knowledge. Glycoproteins, those are those fraction of the fiber, which, which are, are results of the, of the um, um, heat and treatment during the um, uh, oil crashing. So um, if there is uh, excess of heat, the, the part of the fiber, those the reducing sugars, could bond to the protein, particularly lysine. And then therefore, they, just to simplify it, they become part of the fiber. This lysine, although still is present in the meal, will not be available for, for animals to, to utilize as a nutrient. So therefore, the, the, the entire effort was to understanding how processing may affect it and how, how mild condition could be applied and then and to preserve the protein. So as you can see in canola meal, the glycoproteins are still present, they still will be, but, uh, but I said it's definitely way lower than historically has been noticed because processors, as I said, they really, really understand the, the value of the co-product. So I mentioned that, that canola fiber could be utilized as a prebiotic. Um, as you may be aware that, that um, animal um, industry has been using antibiotic growth promoters uh, for years. Now we are, we are going away from this and then because the, the overall progress in animal production, so they are not that needed. However, antibiotics really supported the, the um, uh, gut health and the, they provide the good balance in the gut means um, they, um, um, they suppress the pathogenic bacteria that not necessarily benefit animals, but there's like a huge impact of the food safety of the animal byproduct. Therefore, there's a huge pressure on finding something which could be alternative for antibiotics, growth promoters, but it would not be antibiotic per se. So whole, whole spectrum of the, of the products like prebiotic, probiotics has been, has been um, um, studied. So um, we, um, so, so, yeah, we decided to take advantage of particularly of those non-starch polysaccharides present in a canola meal to, to take advantage of those indigestible um, uh, compounds which are indigestible for the host animals but, but useful for the microbiota in the gut. We all know that, that in animals or in humans, this microbiota is a huge microcosmos. It's, a, it's a like an like a other, other um, entire biome supporting our health. They are there for, for purpose. So, uh, so we have to make sure that they are fed properly and, then, and therefore we may take advantage. How prebiotics works. So first of all, they will benefit proliferation of those bacteria. But presence of bacteria is not the goal. It's all about getting the stuff which bacteria are producing. That will be the, for example, the short chain fatty acids. They support the gut health, and also they, they play a very significant role in the, in the physiology of the, of the host animal or human. Another important thing is that the prebiotics may, may also protect the mucosa of the, the layer of the gut from attracting the, the microbes away. So basically they will, they will take the room. They will, they will exclude, this, uh, exclude those pathogenics, therefore they will not attach and they will be, um, they will be uh, excreted. So that is relating to the reducing of the population of the pathogens in the, or in the, in the body. That will benefit health of animal itself, but also that will uh, directly be related to the food safety. As for example, Salmonella being at the, being at the organism which is rather inert for, for poultry, but it's the main concern for, for humans, right? So, so it has both, both benefits. 
So we use the technology, enzyme technology, to degrade the, the dietary fiber, and therefore we will um, generate the, the uh, we generate the enzyme hydrolysis products, those which then will be very useful for, for enhancing, enhance the gut development, health, and function. Enzyme hydrolysis um, um, uh, also of canola fiber will contribute to the extra metabolizable energy by releasing those, those um, carbohydrates which still can contribute to, to, to uh, energy um, for the growing or producing livestock. Non-starch polysaccharides that it will be composed of the of the this like a polymers of the of the sugar cellulose is one of those that a large polymer of the of the of the glucose. But in canola, canola the other other polysaccharides are also present. That will be the arabinogalactan, arabinoxylans, xyloglucan, and also plenty of the pectic substances. The, uh, Canola pectic substances are different. They're highly branched, different though from those which you may be familiar with, that those pe pectins in the juices and so on. They are water-soluble, different substances. Canola pectins are, uh, are different um, and, um, uh, and, and, and insoluble. So you have to remember that, that the fiber is not only in the hull, like we could think that's that what protects the seed. But fibers, uh, the, the non-starch polysaccharides are also present in the embryo. As you can see the cross section, they build those cells when the nutrients, oil and proteins are there. So, so this is also important thing. So the, the hulls are mainly composed of the, of the cellulose. The, the inner, the inner um, fiber components are, um, they've got a little bit different structure. But so if it comes to the, to the canola meal, so the all is in a, in a mixture, that's, and also that's how we, how we decided to, to, to um, hydrolyze those, those um, um, non-starch polysaccharides. This sort of aligns what was presented in the first uh, presentation. The part of the, of the fractionation with Dr. Janita was presenting, that was also about the enzymes. But we were trying to do the, the practical application. We, ex, we explored the, the lots of enzymes. Um, so this is this, the, the, this, this sort of um, diagram of what we starting with and what we're going to get. So enzyme hydrolysis product, they may be all spectrum of the product. They could be the low, low molecular polysaccharides, short chain polysaccharides, and also simple sugars. We don't really ne necessarily measure all of them. Them that's re really require the advanced technology, but that's also not the goal. How we see it in our in our studies, that's the example. The disappearance of the non-starch polysaccharides in our analysis that will be reflecting in the producting production of the of the of the um, um, NSP hydrolysis products bioactive components. This is just the the the, the one of the slides which which uh, Yang Sing uh, presented in her PhD thesis. We use a uh, you think is, can see the, the different pectinases with the combination of the cellulases, and we went down from 22 percent of NSPs to 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 15. So mostly the all the NSPs present in the embryo has been hydrolyzed. That is really impressive results. And then we decided to enzymatically modify canola meal and see and see how it may be applicable for the, for the animals. So in a lab scale, we, we treated canola meal with enzymes, fermented for the, I mean, incubated for 48 hours, and then we produced enzymatically modified canola meal. So the product was freeze-dried, we analyzed it, and we, we, with intention of using it in animal feed. On the industrial scale, we were, we were a little bit farther with the separation of this because spray freeze drying would not be a op good option in the large scale. So, uh, so we decided to go for the, with the spray drying and, the, and the, for the purpose of this, we selected the water solubles then uh, from this uh, product. During this, this 48 hours, 
we um, benefit from the spontaneous fermentation. No organism was included or like uh, inoculated, but fermentation has happened, giving them as extra benefit of, of it. So uh, we measure over time how the lactic acid improved, like the, was produced by bacteria. Therefore, the pH of this, of this product was, was down. In animal nutrition, the low pH is a, is a beneficial thing. So we also, as you may see in this, in this little graph on the right side, when treated, canola meal treated with enzymes, we, uh, we definitely have seen some, some uh, reduction of the non sludge polysaccharides component. <laughs> Meanwhile, we also uh, use some kind of bacteriostatic um, um, chemicals to really see how much work would be credited to enzyme, how much to, to bacteria. And then it has been proven that, that yeah, enzymes are still doing the very good thing. And if you could see the canola meal, this is conventional canola meal and the, um, and the enzymatically modified. So this is basically the same product. Nothing has been excluded. ECMS, this is the soluble fraction of, of ECM. So as you can see, the, during the, the fermentation in, a, in, in a ECM, we still preserve the good, good level of protein. Nothing happened there. The, the oligosaccharides were reduced to zero. Bacteria reduced the phytate content, which for, animal, um, um, for, for animals is a beneficial, but then, then more phosphorus is available, not bound to phytate. Uh, then, as, as you see, the total dietary fiber went down. So, um, and, uh, and add also the lactobacillus species, uh, we measure this reflects the, the fault change. So in the ECM, there was over 300 times more lactobacillus than in the, in the canola meal. So, uh, and therefore that is corresponding to the production of the lactic acid and, uh, and the reducing the pH. When we talk about the solubles, yet we see this one, but you see that we are really, really selected those enzyme hydrolysis products and, uh, and the lactic acid also went to to this, this, so this is truly, truly probi prebiotic, but with some, um, some elements of the of the uh, uh, probiotic as well, due to presence of the lactic acid, acid bacteria. We run the preliminary uh, growth performance study. We have to really make sure that animals will eat it, or there will be no other uh, effect which we could not foresee. Being so excited about this development. So as you can see, at FI stands for the feed intake, body weight gain, and the feed conversion ratio means how much feed is converted to the unit of the, of the body weight. So even if we use the, the low ECM, the enzymatically modified canola meal, the results was, were, were, were uh, numerically better than control. However, these diets, you have to remember, they were formulated to meet all the nutrients, so we don't, did not really expect any huge improvement. But that, that what we've seen, there's no adverse effect, and they're doing really well. We went as high as 20% uh, of ECM in it, so the results were also comparable to the control. So it gave us more confidence, and then we did more in-depth um, analysis, so NSP's digestibility in animals improved uh, significantly. Sialic acid measurements, we measure it as a, as a, um, a response to the, the, how gut is interacting with the, what's in, the dig in, in, in it. So um, if something is alarming, they will produce the, the sialic acid and mucin. So it was reduced, that's okay. Contribution to the AME, definitely. We also measure the, the microbiota, and as you can see, that the lactobacillus has been present. Also, uh, there is a, sig a significant decrease of the E. coli, uh, the pathogenic bacteria in the, in the gut. And then we've done another study with the solubles. So at 2%, they, they improve feed intake and then and the body weight gain, animals really like it. Also, we went with the, with the challenge study with Salmonella. So uh, we, we challenge uh, animals and uh, see um, uh, if, the, if there will be response of this prebiotic to, 
to such challenge, so that the treatments were like we, we had the three treatments. Uh, in the one, we added 1% of solubles. As you can see, there was the significant decrease of the presence of salmonella in excreta and cica. And also, we, we check if the salmonella is getting into the organs. So, uh, so that was no, it, it was positive, it was not there. So, but definitely we see the improvement. Use the ECMS in the, in the um, uh, wind piglets. Response was also good. Um, then there was significant lower pH in, in the colon and the um, higher population of the beneficial bacteria. So that was a good response. So the findings, the significant findings was that, that the enzymatic modification would improve the energy utilization, will, 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 will really definitely improve the gut environment, and then um, uh, increase, increase the presence of the beneficial bacteria, therefore they will benefit from the, their presence, and then decrease pathogenics, both E. coli and, uh, and the salmonella. So enzymatically modified and fermented canola meal and its water-soluble fraction can improve gut function, health, and support the antibiotic-free programs in the poultry and, pro and, uh, and swine production. The research was done with con collaboration and the support of the many institutions, which I wanted to, to acknowledge. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, you may want to stay here for questions. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to, I believe uh, Nandika is online to answer questions. No? And Janitha is not? No? Okay. Uh, Dr. Rex Newkirk, is, is, doc, is, is Rex Newkirk online? He was looking at, I think he was looking as an online moderator. Okay, so Rex may have some then questions from our online audience, but uh, before we go to Rex, any questions for, for uh, Anna uh, from anybody here in the audience? Ralph? No? Yeah, no problem. He's, okay, I have a question. Um, in terms of in terms of scalability, you'd you'd mentioned you'd you'd done some work in in, in terms of scaling up production, et cetera. Um, how 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 scalable are we right now? Um, what sort of investments do you think may be needed? And also, do you need to con can you use some just conventional meal in the diet itself? You probably showed that, and I probably missed it. But um, thank you. I'm glad that you ask. This product, the, the ECMS solubles, is actually already available in the market. We've done it with collaboration with Kenyan Biosystems, uh, formerly no, uh, I mean CBS Bio Platform, formerly now as a Kenyan Biosystems. They invest, they invest in this, in this, and they already producing and marketing this uh, uh, prebiotic type of canola. And then, and definitely we're not trying to replace canola meal. We're still promoting canola um, as a fit ingredient, viable source of protein for, for monogastric animals. This is just uh, literally adding value to, to on getting some extra value from, from canola meal. And also for the marketing purpose, um, that, that you know that those extracts could be could be marketed all around the world rather than shipping the tons of of canola all the way. I hope I answered the question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Oh. Hi. Uh, is your study based on meal coming straight out of a canola processing plant, like commercial available meal? Or are you, um, you know, also requesting or suggesting a modification of the processing of meal so that you get a better meal? I guess uh, what I'm wondering is, with your work, can we 
modify or improve meal after the fact so we don't need a major change in the facilities currently in, in operation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, thank you. Now, for this processing, we just use conventional canola meal um, as it's available in the market, nothing, nothing fancy. I don't really think there is a huge need of doing any modification the, at the, during the processing. I, I personally admire how industry is really dealing well with this and the canola meal quality itself is really high and the, and the nutritionists really appreciate that. Do we have any questions online? We do, yes. Can you hear me? We do. Yeah, Curtis? Yep. Good. Excellent. So, uh, okay, you can hear me now, okay? I can, yeah. Good. Uh, there's a question here for Janitha. And I, I see Janitha's online, so she will answer this. In relative terms, what proportion of the Canadian meal production is going into animal feed versus protein isolates versus bioproducts like bioplastics? Uh, what are the potential proportions once the markets develop? If, is Janitha online? She is? <laughs> Yeah, she's online. I allowed her to talk, so we can open it here. Do you need that? Yeah. Uh, can okay. you hear me, please? You bet. Go for it. Yeah. Um, I wish I have that data, which is difficult to obtain. Um, but uh, I see is there's no Canadian protein isolate production at this point. Probably those who know about the industry uh, have know what is happening. And then bioplastics also, I don't know any uh, data related to how much goes into bioplastics um, of the meal. Uh, my understanding is majority is going, or oh, 99% maybe or at least 95% is going for animal feed. Excellent, thank you. And for Anna, there's a question here for you. Uh, what are the approximate costs of the enzyme treatments and how could any enzyme cost hurdles be overcome? What are some of our options to overcome the costs of, of the treatment? Um. Thanks, Rex. The, the cost of enzyme, is, it's not really that critical because like the company which is processing uh, the way we, we design it, it's, uh, they, they supply, they've got a, um, those are the enzyme companies, so they've, they've, they've got resources. The additional processing will be the extra cost. However, it's uh, mitigated as well. And then, so we, during this study, we also applied enzyme into the diet as well as other way of getting the enzyme hydrolysis products in, in the gut. However, in this processing, we're taking advantage of the longer present, longer exposition uh, of enzymes to the substrate, therefore it's more effective. So, so yeah, there is, um, there is a certain, certain advantage and value added to this, therefore the cost has been, has been um, mitigated. So some of these enzymes are pretty widely available now, like CVS sells enzyme mm -hmm. cocktails with, with some of these enzymes in it, maybe not the exact same portions you use, but they are commercially available, I believe. Yeah, I agree. The, the thing is, as I presented the, the, the graph, we've been testing different kind of enzymes, cellulase A, B, C, D, they will react differently. So that's the entire exercise was to really target the specific enzyme to the, not only the specific activity, but the specific enzyme. They could be produce, produced by different uh, or microorganisms. They could be produced as some multi-enzymes. There could be some site activities present, which we cannot measure because like, bacteria are much cleverer than we are. So, uh, so, so this, all, all, all this, this research was about the finding the very, specific enzyme preparation, mixing it with other specific enzyme preparation to and select the most efficient one. So it's not only about the gathering first available cellulase and, uh, and expecting the same results. Fair enough, that's good. Mm -hmm. the, I, I do have one more question for you. Um, so you've done a fair bit of work with the yellow seeded natus. Um, do you think that pectic substance 
is there would be more available to the enzyme or less? Are, they, are, are, is, are the black seeded, yellow seeded sort of the same as far as that pectic? It, no, we've, we've proven that the, that the fiber is a slightly different in all those yellows, yellow seeded uh, canolas. However, and, and yeah, and we, the earlier research was showing that enzyme could add it to the diet, could improve digestibility of those, those um, uh, meals. Um, however, we didn't do this, this very specific uh, exercise with the yellow seeded. Just we decided to, to upcycle the, the conventional canola meal, which is produced in a large amount and uh, by Canadian processors. Thank you. Thanks, Rex. Um, one quick check. Is Dr. Bandera on the line? No. Okay. Well, he did say if you had questions, email him. I know I have a lot of questions to email him, so I'm going to do that. Um, I, I do have, I think we still have a little bit of time, so I have one, uh, one, one question for you as well, Anna. Um, and this is speculating a little bit too, and I'm going to just go quickly to another system I think that you've worked on in the past you and Bogdan, and that is that the, the resistant starch coming from the potato processing in Manitoba with Manitoba starch products. And their, their, uh, their, their ingredient or their additive is actually looking, you know, they're doing the same thing, using it as a probiotic or prebiotic, and they've, um, they've successfully uh, reduced um, antibiotic treatments for scours in weanlings. Do you, do you think we're down this same path where we can utilize this approach to again replace, directly replace antibiotics, and how much? Uh, um, the starch content is not that significant in a, in a canola, and uh, it's mostly not really resistant to digest digestive system. So, but definitely uh, resistant starch is a phenomenal. Um, um, it's a, it's a, p a prebiotic itself. So, uh, so, but definitely, we, uh, nutritionists always focus on the getting energy from all the ingredients could, which could provide the energy, and like fiber including, resistant starch including. Sometimes it's like a, oh, 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 like take advantage of this, what is present there, not necessarily really, really take only energy from this. But definitely, resistant starch could be a fabulous, fabulous um, um, alternative to antibiotics because it will really well promote the, the, the beneficial bacteria in the gut. Both piglets, um, piglets are specifically susceptible to, to the um, um, dysbiosis and uh, they, they will really um, grow less if there's uh, some issue. But all other monogastric animals definitely will, will, will um, benefit from the resistant starch in the diet. I have one more question for Janita, if we got a minute. Yeah, we, we do. <laughs> sure. So Janita, I'm gonna put you on the spot. You, you've done a great deal of re research uh, in this area. And so you've had a chance to think a lot about valuation and, and, and creating value. What do you think is the, um, has the greatest potential for value return in terms of volume, in terms of just economic return on pro further processing of canola? Is it the protein isolates for human food? Is it the industrial applications? Is it, what, what do you, what, what do you, where do you think the future lies? <laughs> I won't hold it to you in the future, however. <laughs> <laughs> you have put me in a difficult spot. Uh, <laughs> um, what I see is, in terms of volume of production, okay, how I see this approach is what market or the demand is for in terms of what is available in canola meal. So as Anna also pointed out, fiber and protein are the most uh, uh, valuable components that we can get out of canola meal. Um, so is there a market for canola protein? Yes, we see the plant protein market is there. So this amount of protein that canola crop generates, and we can see then there will be a potential to go into a plant protein market. So how does canola protein can compete in there? So that again depends on how uh, economically we can obtain canola protein to compete with pulse protein or 
any other alternative protein that comes into uh, plant protein market. So that is where one of the ways we can say. And then of course the fiber fraction, because it is not starch we are talking about. There are different other sugars that form fibers. And also we don't have to go to monomer level as uh, Anna is showing some of the um, oligomers, we can oligosac oligosaccharide level or some of the broken down, uh, mostly with microbial fermentation and those kind and some of the fermentation, we can use that in different applications. So there are two uh, things in kind of a meal that has value and we have to take that. Uh, so I wouldn't say it's all protein, we need to put it into uh, human food uh, protein market, that may be the star the position if we can reach and which can bring most of the value at this point. Then fiber also, we have lots of potential from canola meal. And then bioplastics and whatever nitrogen based molecules can go in and also fiber based molecules can go into biodegradable plastic or polymer production. And so there is potential um, and we have shown that potential. <laughs> um, so how to bring it to a really economical business model, that is the question. And I think that is the struggle we are having because it's a very competitive uh, market out there for proteins and fibers and all these. Thank you. I, I think it's an unfair question, of course. Uh, but I had to ask you anyway. But I think really it's a tie-in of all of the species. It's like it's it's the animal aspects, it's the, the the proteins, it's the biopolymers. I think as we go forward processing, if we have more collaboration between those groups, we can, uh, you know, in a single plant, you could have many of those dreams come out, and that might be the most uh, economical way to go. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I agree guess that's... that. Uh, I think we have a good model. Uh, we don't need to. Uh, always, uh, we have we can learn from soy industry. To go into plant protein market, it's like, it may not be huge amount we need. Can we process similar to soy, a fraction of canola meal to be suitable to extract protein? Because in food protein, functionality is very important. We know there is good nutrition or protein quality in canola protein how we can keep functionality, protein quality, not only the driving factor in food protein market. Okay, thank you. I think I'm gonna have to close the session now. Thanks, Janitha and Anna and Nandika. Thank you very much. Uh, join again with a round of applause for our speakers. And we're gonna break for coffee. Thanks, Rex, as well. And I think we're back here, Taryn, at 10.30, correct? Half an hour? Okay, thank you. <laughs>